Welcome back to the channel. Hello, I'm Mark Headley. With me today is Mitch Brisker for another episode of Mark and Mitch Make a Scientology Film. Thanks for joining me, Mitch. No problem. Good to be here with you, Mark. It's good to see you again. It's been a while. Yeah. Our schedules have been all jammed up and we finally uh, figured yeah, it out. We took a little break. I mean, I still have, I get endless messages from people wanting us to do more of these episodes. That's so. what I was just about to say. I was like, back by popular demand, we yeah. have been getting exactly. messages and comments like, Hey, are you guys going to keep doing the yeah. film or not? I'm like, yeah, yeah, we'll get there. But I, I got to tell you, though, in all honesty, if people hated us doing this, I would still want to do it because it's so much fun. It is fun. And also, yeah. I was thinking about it the other day. There's no other place where there's any record of these things actually happening or the behind right. the scenes stuff. Or, right. I mean, there might even be people that are in um, the world of Scientology and Golden Era Productions that don't know these stories that took place because nobody ever um, told them about them and we well, were plus, the only who know about them. <laughs> yeah, if you were on the other side of the street, you know, working at whatever, CMO Ant or RTC or audio or any of those other, everything is, you know, very isolated in Scientology. And even at the base, the different divisions were even isolated from one another. Completely. So, yeah, a lot of this might have been going on without anybody knowing about it. Yeah, and there's also sometimes I'll be telling a story about how we did this on a certain film or we did that on a certain film, and there'll be people that used to work in the cinematography division that are like, <laughs> "Who did? Oh, I never heard about that." I was like, "Yeah, you weren't on the shoot crew. You you were, yeah. you were doing your thing, and we were up yeah. doing your thing." You know? Yeah, yeah, um, that's that's a fact. Yeah. So the film that we're going to cover today, guys, is called EM Five, and it's how to set up a session and an e meter. Is that the proper and, time? And, yeah, and the e-meter. How to set up a session e and the e-meter. And, yeah, um, and, and EM, by the way, stands for e-meter film. So this is specifically about e-meters. And this is Hubbard's instructional film about how you set the meter up and how you set the session up. Yeah, and this film was shot in the early 1990s and mm -hmm. it was actually shot before I became a member of the shoot team. Right. And at that time, I was um, I was either working in manufacturing or I was working in quality control at Golden Air Productions. And for this film, um, I, I guess we could backtrack a little bit. Some if this is if this is the first episode you guys have seen um, of this series in at the Scientology International Headquarters, anyone who worked at that property also had a duty besides just being a Sea Org member and doing whatever job you had to do. You were also had the hat of actor. And if you were called <laughs> to be an extra or play a part in one of the Scientology films that was written by L. Ron Hubbard, you couldn't really deny doing it. If you were the right part or you were the right look mm -hmm. or whatever, you had to go do it. And so for this shoot, I got to play a part as an actor in the film mm -hmm. of this guy who just walks in randomly, accidentally. When, when yeah, well, you were one of L. Ron Hubbard's messengers. He had a bunch of messengers with him. Yeah, and your, and I, your part, you were one of the messengers. And I walk in while he's doing this thing. And the reason um, this was portrayed is because one of the things that you're supposed to do when you're supposed to set up the session is you're supposed to put a sign on the door saying, Hey, we're in the middle of a session, an auditing session, so people don't just walk in unannounced, which is what I did. But um, so, but I was not only um, was I in the film um, because I was part of quality control or manufacturing at that time. When the film was produced, I ended up watching this film, every <laughs> single copy of this film that was going to play in Scientology organizations around the world was reproduced on 16 millimeter film and it had mag stripe audio. And it was my job to check every single copy of these films before they went out. So I've seen this film it, at least 400 times because, <laughs> because even though I watched everything, not every one of them passed. And so we right. have to send multiple. And anyway, so I know this film inside and out. Yeah. And, um, and then it, after it was shot in the 90s, it was then reshot later on. Um, and right. I don't know what year you guys shot it at because it was uh, after around 2005, I think, maybe a little later. Okay, so it was after I had escaped from the ant base. In the yeah, scene. yeah, yeah. A couple of years after you had you, you made your, uh, your, your, your final push to freedom. Yeah, so. I just want to show you guys real quick some of the locations, and then we're going to get into sort of the 
the more detail. Yeah, this this film. Story. I mean, it, it it sounds simple in that it's just meant to instruct you how to set up a position in the emitter, but Hubbard having this weird, insane kind of imagination, and having you know made you know his living as a fiction writer, where he just churned out stories, not very good ones, in my opinion. He decided to create this, concoct this whole story around these certain characters and circumstances. And then within that story, you would see how a, a emitter was set up and so forth. And this is very creative stuff, except he, it was a very racist approach he took to the story. Uh, it actually has a, con a connection, which we'll get to with the Nazi propagandist Lenny Riefenstahl, who he reached out for location research. So there's a lot of crazy little things going on with this film. Yeah, I mean, the the, the film starts out where um, a telex is being sent to L. Ron Hubbard. Yeah. A and telex, Martin, a telex. A telex. Yeah. And, they, and when we shot this film in this In film, modern we, times, a telex. Scientology was still sending and receiving telexes, and they yeah. may even be sending and receiving them till this, to this well, day. If they're not, they're referring to whatever they're sending and receiving as telexes. Yeah, and they have like, a whole They, they get an email, and they call it a telex. Yeah, it's wild, guys, because L. Ron Hubbard never mentioned an email in his yeah, so it has to be force writings. So because he called it a telex, they still have right. to call him a telex. Anyway, this it starts out with him receiving a telex and um, his messengers informing him that um, there's some auditor in the middle of um, Africa um, at a Scientology facility that has, has been auditing the son of the king. Right. And he the son of the king is unhappy and is about to cause a big problem. And Scientology is essentially going to be kicked out of the country because of this bad PR situation that's brewing. And so then Hubbard um, is being asked, hey, sir, you've got to come and you've got to handle this. And then he actually flies in and he flies. And this is the best thing of all. If you're in Scientology, this is the most absurd concept ever that L. Ron Hubbard would fly from wherever he is to train the single auditor on how to set up a session. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because that's most... how much he cared. <laughs> yeah, uh, that is ridiculous. that much. Yeah, it's a very ridiculous premise. Yeah, the it's part well, of him it... the part of him coming there. The part of them getting kicked out of, of Africa, that's 100% accurate. <laughs> I think, I'm not sure, but I think it was based on Algeria or Morocco where they work, they did try to audit the king and they were kicked out of the country. And I think that is the story that it was based on. Yeah. And I want to say that Janice, Janice Grady, I think has, Gillum Grady has spoken about this. Um, about yeah, about the but not about the connection with EM five about no 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 being but kicked out of Morocco. Yeah. I think it was Morocco that they were kicked out of. Very possibly, I know that they got they they've been the rocks were thrown at the ships and the Sea Org members yeah. in different ports. So I, I might yeah, have, but you know the, mix so up which one is which. <laughs> so I I think kind of Hubbard takes it on himself to travel to Africa, but he really mock he creates himself as like a white savior, like I'm the white savior that's going to go to Africa and like save everything. And it's pretty crazy the way he, if you really look at the film, like from a political cultural standpoint, you have this very privileged white guy who is going to sit, rescue a problem that really was created by himself. He's the one that really created the problem. And now he's going to go solve the problem. And this is a kind of, it ties in with the indoctrination. In totally. so I told you, because they, they do this to people. They convince people that they're damaged and then, it accepts the people and, the, and just by the fact that they're upset about it is proof that they need help. So then they start, sh uh, you know, forking over money to get help this part of this crazy brainwashing con called Scientology. Yeah. There's another um, thing that I'll put a link in the description, but there's a, basically there's this guy named Chris Owen, who mm -hmm. may be the most pro prolific historian, Scientology historian, who's documenting and digging up L. Ron Hubbard's war records and, all these different things and I'll link to it, but there's a whole article about L. Ron Hubbard and his time in Rhodesia mm -hmm. and how he was there to support the apartheid government and how right. he thought he was Hubbard. Evidently Hubbard was convinced that he was a reincarnation. Uh, he was uh, Cecil, Cecil Rhodes. Yeah. Cecil Rhodes who was gay, by the way, who happened to be a gay man. A gay white supremacist, no less. Yeah, a gay white supremacist. So, <laughs> anyway, so but Hubbard insisted that he was the reincarnation of this guy, and he actually traveled to Africa 
to find the gold and diamonds that he had, that Cecil Rhodes had hidden there somewhere. And um, it's a fascinating article. Um, I'll put a link to it in the description, but they but still, I just have, I just have to interject. They still, yeah. they still deported him. Oh yeah. No, he yeah, actually he, did get kicked out of South yeah. Africa. And, um, <laughs> and it, it's just a weird. So when, if you know all of that, and now we're going to tell you about, about the film, you go like, Oh, the, he, he literally wrote, um, this film with all with all this background information to 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 yeah. as the story to how you set up an e meter in a room and all the different things it's like a it's literally a checklist that he wrote. it's nothing yeah it's nothing there's I a like, picture okay, that shows you, you gotta have a dictionary you gotta have the meter you gotta have a spare meter you gotta check the yeah. meters on charge it's like but but the fact that he had to make this political sort of racist statement to as the backdrop for how to how you set up yeah it's really crazy and we helped him do it because at the time we were of that mind that we thought we were helping the world and we thought we everyone was going to watch this film and love it and so yeah. here let me show i'll put up uh, well they do love it if you're in the brainwashed cult if they love it totally so this is uh the united states and you can see on the on the western end there's california and um, there's a town called San Jacinto and San Jacinto lays right below the Int base. You can see it up there. Uh, I'll move it over here a little bit. Golden Era Productions is right there. The mm -hmm. first time that we shot it, we shot it at this place that was called the Int Ranch. And this is where all of the kids of the right. Sea Org members that worked at the international headquarters. Right, right. This is where they went to school. This complex right here, it was called the Int Ranch. Now it's owned mm -hmm. by the Saboba Indians. Right. And um, it's not, uh, it's not, no longer belongs to Scientology. But this whole village was set up in this area right here. Um, and it's, and it was pretty secluded. And I don't think you could really, I mean, we, you guys had to watch your angles if you didn't want to see any of, of the uh, little town, the little village where the ranch was, but it was sort of in this section here that had little hills all around it. So it pretty, yeah, it was pretty, it, it was a, a, a decent place to shoot. I mean, it was, you know, except for the rattlesnakes and the heat and all the cold and all that other stuff, but yeah. Yeah. And also <clears throat> just, the weather, the weather. So, so you could yeah. build, they built the whole village out there. And I want to say um, the, <laughs> at this property, um, I'll zoom in a little bit here, but there was all these bungalows and um, they've torn a lot of it down by now. But this also used to be the location for what was called the in this uh, in this big empty space right here. Um, this was where the rehabilitation project force was for the international headquarters. Right. So if you were a Sea Org member and you got in trouble, you were sent out to this remote location. And that's where you that's where you lived. You ate. uh slept and did all your rehabilitation and hard labor at this property. And I want to say the first time that we shot um, EM5, that the religious, uh, the uh, rehabilitation project force is the ones who built the majority of the village. Yeah, I think so. I think so. Under, then, with the help of the sets crew, but yeah, and then, uh, and then they were the labor force to build all of the sets. And that yeah. wasn't, uh, and that was the case for many, many of the years that I was there. Mm -hmm. The rehabilitation project force was the main sets and props production facility right. for the shoot crew for most of the nineties and into the two thousands, even when it was eventually, there was a lot of uh, bad press around there being this uh, labor camp um, near the Scientology right. facility. And um, even when it was disbanded and gotten rid of almost all those people became sets and props people. Yeah, uh, right. the ones that were the backdrop artists and the props people, they became right. part of sets and props. Um, and then we'll go to the golden era productions. But I, I just want to add to that. Interestingly yeah. enough, even though the RPF and the sets people like it was built by adults, once we were finished with the film, it was just left. Uh, it was abandoned. The back lot That's was abandoned right. and it sat there forever. And then eventually it became like a fire hazard. So they had the kids take it apart. I'm pretty like, sure the kids actually used to go out. I want, I, I don't know if I'm remembering my stories right, but I yeah. think 
from some of the ranch kids that I've spoken to, there was a fair bit of nonsense that would happen out there at the little village. Right. Cause it was sort of, you could kind of go out there and nobody would know you were out there. Cause you'd be in one right. of these little huts or whatever. Right. But, right. Um, but, but you're right. I think eventually. No, I, I remember. Children because, had to disassemble the village. Yeah, they, they had them tear it all down. And the thing is, it was infested with rattlesnake nuts, oh. nests. But I don't think the kids, I mean, back then, if you killed a rattlesnake and you turned it into security, you got a $15 reward, remember? <laughs> so, yeah, there was something like that. I think there was. Yeah, a which is. Yeah, which is not a good thing because you don't want to promote people going and killing rattlesnakes or anything else. But I think the kids were out there with shovels, like collecting, you know, bank, killing rattlesnakes. So anyway, it's just they were not treated well. It was a horrible place. Uh, yeah, there was anyway. nothing good about the about that facility, and especially yeah, I mean, the ranch. The RPF was there. The kids were there. Yeah, it was horrible. There's a story. One time there was a fire. There was a fire at the end base where the mountain was set on fire by one of the, the Scientology uh, Sea Org member security guards. And the people that came to put out the fire were prisoners and um, they were going to sleep up on the hill above the base during the night after they'd done all the firefighting. And, and I think David Miscavige or some big Scientology executives heard about this and they were like, you've got to sort this out. This can't be. And so the port captain a uh, guy by the name of Ken Hoden, he made arrangements for the all of the prisoners to sleep at the ranch with the kids instead of. Oh no! That, that no. was that was his solution. And then when they found out about that, it was like what? Oh, <laughs> anyway, so God. yeah, not a lot of good happening on that. Now this is no. the this is the Ant base, and um, uh, there's a highway that runs between it. On the right side of the highway, that is pretty much. Um, Religious Technology Center and International Management is on the on the what was called the north side of the highway. Yeah, and the hole, the notorious hole, was on the north side. And the hole, yeah. Here, I'll zoom in on the hole so you can and, see. And audio. Right. Well, it's it's gone now, but it might be in this. Well, picture. yeah, that that double wide trailer right in the middle of the screen. That's where the hole yeah, was. There you and go. There these you go. buildings were International Management and um, audio, the audio recording studios and archives, audio storage, and all that other stuff. Yeah. And then up here is where the city council was, that big uh, building there with the lake in front of it. And then right over here is where you guys reshot it later in these uh, the, in the mid. Right, right, and, right. Uh, yeah, we reshot it there. I came up with this crazy plan because basically, uh, it's kind of hard to explain, but I I I wanted the work at gold to be as it sounds weird, but I, I want it to be as convenient as possible for me. Okay. So I, it doesn't I know sound that weird. sounds <laughs> that no, checks but, out from when I was there, that totally <laughs> checks out. Like literally yeah. we're working all night and all day. And Mitch is like, I don't want to drive an extra 30 minutes to go do this at another location. We should just shoot it here. And you're just, yeah. Like, I was always figuring out ways all night and day. And you're worried about, traveling an extra 30 minutes yeah well it wasn't that bad mark you're kind of exaggerating but i mean usually i would come up with these plans and they would kind of benefit everybody so i said look why don't we just build the back lot right outside the castle it's right next to sets production and what we could do is we could build the whole village the only problem is is that gold doesn't know how to do backdrops because in a situation like that my plan was we're going to shoot the exteriors on this back lot and then we'll replicate the sets in the studio and we'll shoot all the interiors inside, which means you have to have really realistic backdrops outside all the doors and windows. You have to shoot the actual environment that you're shooting in and then create backdrops. They didn't know how to do that. So, and then I said the rest of it, you know, the road and the castle, we'll remove it with, with uh, CGI. We'll just take it out. And so this meant that if it rained one day, we could go in the castle and shoot. Uh, it meant that we could finish the film much faster. I mean, it was more expensive to do it that way, yeah. but it was much so, quicker. Yeah. The but they cast. didn't know how to, yeah, but they didn't know how to do backdrops. So, so the next thing I'm complaining about to Miss Gavage with these guys, they just don't know how to do backdrops, blah, blah, blah. So the next thing I know, I'm like invited to spend four days on the set of War of the Worlds to see how Spielberg's people do these backdrops, right? Which I knew how they did it. I just needed to bring it back to gold. Um, I just need to send a text to my kid to handle the dog. Because <laughs> he said he, he said he would handle the dog and he's not doing it. Uh, but it, it, anyway, so I went back there. This is one of the backdrops from War of the Worlds. This is like the 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 uh 
the uh, the set that was used as the interior for the uh, for the house, the home that Tom Cruise lived in. This these were the literal views outside that actual place. It wow. was an it was an actual place, and then they shot these huge. They're called Duratrans, and then they hung these around the set. I have durable, a ton of pictures. Durable of transparencies. So it's yeah, like a durable. picture. It's like a picture that you could backlight, and then yeah, you could put a light behind it, and it's it's just a standard way that you do believable backdrops in Hollywood. And so then Gold got into full gear on figuring how to do this and buying the printer and all that stuff. And I can show you. We have a. You should show. We have a picture of the actual village, the external one. Oh, okay. Well, I have a whole bunch of pictures. I'm, yeah, well, we could, we could, we could, we could, we could put them up and go through them, and then we could talk Perfect. about the film itself. Okay, so that's an actual background. That's you're inside the studio, and you're on a set, and what you're looking at is a gigantic Duratrans of the actual location that's outside the studio. So, oh, and, so you guys could build you. So you build sets. Ah, oh, this makes so much more sense. We always had yeah. sound problems doing it the other way. Yeah. We'd have to wait for a chopper. Or we'd have to wait for a plane or we'd have to wait for, it was always a nightmare when we shot it on location at the, yeah, right. exactly. Exactly. So this is actually hot. how you, this is how you really do this. And I finally got them to like spend the time and the money to do it. It wasn't oh easy. It only, it only took 15 years, but yeah. <laughs> So, but you, you can do all the films twice to do them the way you. Yeah, want. exactly. To actually get them done right. So, like for instance, this is a scene inside the castle, and outside what you're seeing outside the window is a photograph, a giant photograph, of the environment that's outside the castle where the ex exterior set was, and, and dressed it, up and photoshopped and made all nice. And yeah, just yeah, yeah. But it matches perfectly. So wow, and that's the messenger. That's the main character in the film. Yeah, yeah. He's uh, yeah. The guy that you and I did it with was yeah. Uh, he that guy was a ten. That yeah, he was, was amazing. So the guy was um, and this is a funny thing about um, I want to say David Miscavige's perception of actual Sea Org members and actual messengers is yeah. this guy um this the guy who played this part in the 1990s film he was the most amazing messenger that had ever been showed on shown on film in inside yeah. Scientology and he wasn't a Sea Org member he wasn't even a Scientologist no. he just no. was playing the part that L Ron Hubbard had written and yeah, he was average was yeah. like touting this guy as he's a better messenger than any messenger alive yeah yeah it was and the guy lived. was he was a, he was basically a, an actor in a stand up comic, and he was. I mean, the guy kept us in stitches. Uh, oh, he was like much. full time, very like, funny, on just always just joking and yeah. I mean, it, it's fun. kind of a comically written part. I mean, the guy's a wise ass. Uh, yeah. Hubbard envisioned all of his uh, the, the messengers as being kind of very uh, having a sort of a superiority complex and being really wise asses and kind of enjoying ridiculing people. Totally. This guy does it, but it seems funny because it's being written as comedy. Yeah. So yeah, anyway, we <laughs> we could kind of spin through the rest of these, and then we'll talk Perfect. about. Yeah. So there's another one that's inside. Uh, that's actually you're inside the studio. It's not an exterior shot. Okay. Okay. So this is uh, a sign leading it. We built this entire village, and it's it's supposed to be a fictional African country called. Mahali Arafiki. And so this is the sign because we know every African village must have a welcome sign. Yeah. That and that's true. another weird thing that they don't ever really explain is because a lot of uh, L. Ron Hubbard also recorded the voiceover for this film. Mm. No, not just the voiceover, not just the voiceover. He's featured in the film. I understand, uh, but I'm saying yeah. he recorded this voice, the voiceover, for right? All he the did voiceovers for this film when he was still alive, even though we're shooting it in the night. It never got produced until the 90s. He was he he passed away in 86, so he had already pre recorded the voiceovers right. to do for this. And then we would do these over the shoulder shots of a body right. double or some guy's arm that looked like him. When when we originally did the film, did we use Marcus? For uh, no, 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 no. We had a guy. I can't think of his name. I think he was the same guy who did the beingness film. The be TR sixteen. Yeah, he was that okay. kind of big redheaded guy. Yeah, but, but Hubbard also he had a camera when he he recorded the voiceover, but he also recorded all of his hand mo motions. 
Yeah. So, so the know, guy could match the mimic yeah. of what he did with his arms and hands and yeah yeah but, but what i want to say because i've seen the film a million times right right they say in the very opening sequence they say they want you to go to africa and then he and then he they're like okay we're going and then they go to mahali arafiki and you're like right. i thought they were going to africa where, where where's arafiki i've never even heard of that and yeah. that's always a part that i always thought like why couldn't they just do one or the other like he could have said in the VO, they want you to go to Arafiki and then go to Arafiki. But anyway, whatever. Small. Yeah, that's, well, my, it's, that's my nitpick it's, of, of watching the film well, uh, five hundred yeah. times and saying this is weird. <laughs> yeah, it's just it's a fictional country that sounds kind of really corny, like a kid would make it up. <clears throat> so yeah, that's uh, what do we have? Okay, so now you can see the extent of, of this uh, this African village. Interestingly enough, the landscape in Southern California and this part of Southern California is very similar to the landscape in, in this one part of Africa where this would, it's in kind of Northeast Africa where this is supposed to be. So the, the, you know, the vegetation and so forth is, is relatively similar. I'm not sure why that there's that one. And then there's this one. I'm not sure. Oh yeah. No, I think I just graded one and I just act. <laughs> okay. So here's another thing. When you're casting a film in L.A. and you're trying to do an African village, you really need to find a bunch of people that are from the same part of Africa, because if you just start casting randomly, you know, black actors, they're going to look like they're from all over the place. Right. Yeah. They need to they need to look like they're from the same tribe. So fortunately, there's a, I found a, there's a, there's a, a community of Nigerians in North Hollywood. Okay. Who are, who are actors and musicians and dancers. And so I hired and they were happy to be in the film. The only problem is, as I was going through the script, there's a scene that Hubbard wrote where there's a oh, woman yeah. and two small children and they're looking in a window with curiosity about what's happening and they're eating bananas. And he refers to them in the script as pickaninnies. Yeah. Which is a really not a, it's a very racist not a, term. Not a current approved uh, terminology. <laughs> yeah, no, no. It, it's anyway. There's so a lot I of just things I, like that in these films, by the way. That's not an isolated thing where there's yeah, so yeah, there's a references lot, and yeah, and, yeah, racist, ra also misogynistic, sort of very super. not. We've talked yeah, about so, this in some of the other videos, but yeah, I mean, even we talked about it. We. we in the audio division of Golden Air Productions, there's a whole team of people that that are editing out uh, racial slurs and coughs, and um, there is another uh, uh, just editing out anything inappropriate um, right. that's currently inappropriate. And L. Ron Hubbard did so many of those that it's there's an actual thing that's written on. You got to take these things out. Right. Um, well, th so just let me see that. Yeah. So I had to. The, the what we call the sides, the pages of the script needed to be delivered to these actors, and I couldn't, in, in good conscience, that's I called my there's myself. I'm the, sorry, I didn't, I thought there was no, more that's okay, these, but there's yeah, some that's a, yeah, I refer to that as Indiana Jew, by the way. <laughs> so I know it's terrible. Um, I can say that I'm Jewish, yeah, but anyway, so I'm no, but so <laughs> yeah, don't so so I had to uh. I had to give these these script pages to these actors and I couldn't ask permission to change Hubbard's words because that's just yeah. like a no-no. So I just went ahead and changed it and 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 got them, you know, I took the racial, the bad racist stuff out of the script and gave it to the actors. I mean, nobody ever said boo. They were just like, I, well, I was gonna say that's like a there's there's no other easy way out of that situation to just do it and 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 yeah you know, does it ask for forgiveness not permission because nobody ever said a word no, were... there's no way that you could you could change it with authority with with being approved that you would yeah do. he's never going to get approved to but change if you changed it and then somebody yeah. found out why they'd be like you know he, no, he really it, had to do that <laughs> there's no way around that yeah, but these people were, they were lovely people. They were good to work with. I have some other pictures. Now, look, we even had zebras. The reason I, I have this I was going to say, that is like some serious background. Yeah, no, we we had, and you know, I posted this picture on Facebook. Yeah. It just said, oh, it didn't say anything about what it was. And people thought Nothing. I just there. said, oh, <laughs> yeah. And I got in so much trouble for revealing you went on safari. <laughs> yeah. I got in so much trouble with ethics of gold because I'm like, you're revealing our plans to our enemies. And I'm like, no, no. I'm not. It's, oh, yeah. A picture, a three shot with zebras. 
Yeah, because yeah, because you know, you have people in the Sea Org, well, you have people at Scientology organizations whose job it is to uncover problems and solve them. <laughs> and if they can't find problems to solve, then they're in trouble. That's true. So, they're yeah. like literally paid to witch hunt. <laughs> that's their job. Yeah, yeah. That's the reason that Scientology Media Productions is such a disaster, is you had the entire the, the statistic of the H of, of the ethics department is is like uh what do they call it flaps found and handled flaps yeah and situations handled. found and handled, and, handled. And, if, and if they can't find a situation to handle they got no statistic that's so, true i never thought of it that way it's the, sort of like hey what are you doing oh uh, there's no situation sir uh you better make some you better find yeah, you better, some. <laughs> yeah that can't be true yeah there's no way there's no nonsense going on yeah so anyways weird stuff so anyway th these were lovely people that uh uh, they, and they 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 really liked the village. They recognized. They actually validated it as as being very authentic from the, uh, an African village. And and uh, so yeah, they were great. I tried to hire them to do the score for the film, but the musicians wouldn't let me because some of them were very talented musicians. Okay, now before we show this next video, yeah. there's a video. There's actually two little clips. I do want to. Now that you've brought this up, I do want to say yeah. something about this. When this film was originally shot in the 1990s, yeah, um, the musicians have a thing that's called uh, Hubbard wrote a policy, a bunch of policies, and he called it the art series. Right. And and the and there's art series one and two and three and so on. Well, there's a policy or this bulletin that he wrote. It's called Art Series Eight. Right. And what he basically wrote is if you're trying to create something and you don't have any sort of um, idea or you don't have any sort of, uh, uh, what do you call it? Like a, a, a proper muse or inspiration. Yeah. Like you should right. go watch other things that other people have right. done and that'll give you an idea. And so the musicians, they could not come up with an African score for this film that, that uh, Miscavige was in any shape or way or form happy with. And one of their art series eight was an album that was produced by Cirque du Soleil at the time. Yeah, I, I gave them that album art. Okay, so yeah, that I, album is the soundtrack to that. Yeah, film. totally. It's such a rip up. They're, they they're, did, they didn't even change. They used the same songs yeah, in the same order in the soundtrack. Yeah, yeah. They there was a, a wonderful piece of African sounding music in, in a Cirque du Soleil show from I don't know probably early nineties. I can't. I have never been able to find it like this. And they just ripped it off. Yeah. So, oh, I mean, we have a little, there you go. We had a little glitch. Oh, I didn't see it. But regardless, when we, when I heard, I, like I told you before, I've listened to this thing yeah. hundreds and hundreds of times. Yeah. And then somebody told me, oh, supposedly the musicians might get in trouble because they, they, no one, they didn't really tell anybody how right. much they ripped it off. And I think Miscavige found out, but we had actually released a music cassette of EM5. Right. right. And I think somebody <clears throat> got a hold of it and they were like, hey, um, are you guys know you're totally 100% ripping off Cirque du Soleil? And then if yeah. you play them, and then I listened to the actual album. And then that's when I realized, oh, they didn't even change the order of the songs. Like that. It's, yeah, it's kind of yeah. wild if yeah, you listen. It's weird, to but um, so if anybody has a copy of the EM5 uh music single that was released in the 1990s, yeah. uh, give that a listen. And uh, I, I've never been able to find that Cirque du Soleil album that they wrote. Um, I'll, I'll remember what it is, uh, okay. I'll remember the name. It was from the if early we, 90s. If we figure it out, we'll put, I'll put it up on the community cage or we'll add, yeah, it yeah, yeah, or something uh, like that. But it's pretty. But it, so if we do find it and you listen to it, you'll at least be able to listen to the soundtrack to the movie because they yeah. just ripped it off. Okay, when yeah. it was redone, did they use that same soundtrack? Again? Pretty much. They pretty <gasps> much used it. No. And, yeah, and I wanted these guys, these Nigerian actors and musicians, they were like the level of African musicians that had played with like, you know, Paul Simon. Like they were yeah. on that level. It's amazing musicians. Well, should and we one of the video? What's that? Because I sing in this video. Yeah, they're, but they're just goofing around. Well, but, I know, but uh, I could hear. Yeah. You can the hear the, yeah. I could hear Seth, the sound guy, saying, giving them instructions. On oh, yeah, because we did record them singing on the set. That's like this true. wild yeah. track or some kind of. Yeah, background. yeah, yeah. Can I play it? <laughs> 
Hold on, there you go. Yeah, I think I, I I shot this on my phone when no one was looking. Yeah, so that I could hear Seth in the background. Yeah. The audio direction. Oh, and they're they're singing and dancing because um, the the auditor is now an okay guy. Like he's. Uh, yeah, they're not going to throw them out of the country. <laughs> yeah, they're not going to throw them out of the country. So they're also. The king is not going to come down on them yeah. and yeah. chuck them out, so they can yeah. sing and they can dance. Yeah. Anyway, I just we went all out to try to make this film as great as we possibly could. Yeah. <coughs> wow. And so in the original, the main character, there's the messenger and then there's right. the auditor. The right. auditor was played by Larry Anderson, who right. was also in the orientation film that was shot right. by Scientology. And he plays sort of the bumbling auditor who doesn't and 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 anybody who knows larry he was a comedic actor and yeah with the, and a music magician and so a magician and light of hand artist yes so he was amazing at the physical comedy that was written for the part because he could sort of make bumbling you know entertaining and it was fun yeah. it was funny he to was watch really good at it and the other thing about this film is it was one of the longest of the Scientology films. Yeah, it's about an hour film. long. Yeah, so a lot of these films that you're watching, they could be 10 minutes or 15 minutes or very short. And this was sort of a film that if you were a student on a course and any course in Scientology <laughs> that involves an e-meter um, that, that you need to be trained on how to use, you get to watch this film. So over the years, there was a lot of students that would say, oh yeah, whenever I was on course, I would try to go and watch that film because it's it's almost it's like almost an hour long and it's not that bad of a watch so people would sort of they knew these lines in the movie and there's yeah. certain things that comedic things that would be said so the wrong room that was a very right. famous so right. even Catch, me, they became catchphrases yeah if ever i walked into an office and it was not where the meeting was i would always be like oh wrong room you know because that yeah. was my thing but um there was also the messenger i think he the uh, larry leaves the window open and all these papers blow all over the right. office and there's just papers and stuff all over the floor and then when the messenger comes in he's berating him and he's like and get these papers picked up or pick these papers oh, yeah. up or something like that and so that was a uh, if you walked into somebody's office and there was stuff on the floor i'd be like pick these papers up um but then well, the main, you, and the actor's yeah. name was it Al Clegg was the who was yeah the the the, the, the African the son of the king the son of the king yeah yes. and he had he played in the NFL for a couple years I think for the Kansas City Chiefs and he had a really bad injury and his NFL career was over so he became an actor great guy yeah definitely was, not from Africa and also <laughs> not a Scientologist yeah yeah so there were besides Larry Larry was a Scientologist. And besides any extras or uh, people like that that we had in the film, um, the the main character, the main cast and actors were not Scientologists. Right. They were right. they were just actors from Los Angeles that were auditioned and then cast for the film. And that so the, uh, we were saying earlier about this guy that played the messenger. He was a very good messenger in terms of mm -hmm. uh, what David Miscavige thought a messenger mm -hmm. should look like and sound like, and 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 uh and perform his duties but then when we did the tr16 film and we got that guy shane uh shane johnson johnson yeah shane he was also another one of these people who played the part of a messenger like even people who knew what a messenger should be like that well guy, yeah people would people would have who were training to be messengers would have to watch these films were ordered to watch them because this is how a messenger is supposed to act so and this kid and these guys were like these were pot smoking actors. I mean, these were just like regular fun people. Yeah. Who, you just, know, who just needed a gig. And that it would just literally showed up to play a part and phone yeah. it in, maybe. I don't even no, I don't well, think I don't they were that. I don't know hard. about that. I mean, I beat them up pretty hard to but but regardless, they yeah. were amazing uh being messengers. 
And the fact yeah. that David Miscavige would tell people, watch this film and watch a guy who's not a Scientologist and not a messenger because he knows yeah. how to be a messenger better than you. That yeah, is a Tuesday at the international headquarters. Oh, yeah, this totally. Happens yeah. All the time. No, totally. Like, look, I couldn't, yeah, he would, his attitude was like, well, like with me, I had to hire this MF or because you guys can't do your jobs. Like it was yeah. always a way of holding something up to ridicule the staff because David Miscavige hates Sea Org members. He hates staff. He hates everybody except, I don't know, maybe four people and some big donors. I mean, literally is yeah. like despises his, people. His movie star, his movie star buddy. Yeah. And his girlfriend and the big donors. And other than that, you're just, you're shit. You're, you're nothing. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's very true. It's but Mark, very wild. It's very you wild. When you're yeah. there and you're like, we're shooting a film with a guy who has, he doesn't, he's never read anything about Scientology. He may have gone to the Celebrity Center to get to his audition or, or whatever, it, um, the Scientology facility at, at uh, Franklin and Bronson in Hollywood, California. But besides that, he doesn't really have any connection to Scientology. And then to hear David Miscavige, and David Miscavige never met this guy. He never spoke. No. With him. He, he had no, no connection with him. And then he would just be like, oh, yeah, this guy's a better messenger than any messenger that's ever been. And you're just like, yeah. what? Yeah. Well, we, we we did the same thing with Katie Mitchell when she was trained to portray the part of an auditor. Yeah. All of a sudden she became the model. She was portraying what it looks like to audit somebody. And then she became the model. Like every auditor in the world had to like model themselves after the way she did it. So it was really same crazy. thing with Jack Armstrong when we yeah, did Jack Arm film. Yeah, he became yeah. the best auditor in the world, like the most yeah. perfect auditor in the world. Yeah, because he didn't he wasn't an auditor. He wasn't yeah, he didn't do the it, golden age attack and all he was an actor pretending yeah. to be auditing. Yeah, and then being edited together for all the best parts. So I just yeah. have to say, do you remember the messenger's final line in the film? Do you remember the last line in the film? I, clowns, I clowns, oh, clowns, yes. will they ever learn? Yes. Doing what Ron says always comes out right. Yeah. Like that is the punchline of the entire film. That's what an egomaniac this person was. He made this entire film so that at the end of the film, he could narcissistically give himself a huge round of applause. It, it's funny because I was thinking about this earlier when we were kind of getting, when I was reading this Chris Owens Rhodesia thing and I was, mm -hmm. I was like, oh, that's right in the film. Hubbard is the hero who saved the day. Like they were, oh, yeah. get, Scientology was going to get a kick, get kicked out of Africa because this yeah. auditor messed up. Hubbard flies in on his chopper. <laughs> he, and within a couple of days, he turns the thing around. The king yeah. scene is, is, is amazingly happy and the yeah. whole thing. And then it's like, we're getting out of here. We're ready to leave. And it's, a, and the, and that's, you're right. The, at the end, the, the, it's like a big pullout shot and the message. Oh yeah. Up. Like the, the, all of those natives are dancing. Like you saw the, the, they're <laughs> yeah. dancing and, and the camera slowly pulls back and then it moves over to the, to the, to the messenger. And he's leaning there being really cocky. And he says, clowns, when will they ever learn? Doing what Hubbard That's said, Ron, doing yeah. what Ron says always comes out right. And yeah. And, and I thought that was so cool when I did it. I mean, I look <laughs> at it now, I'm like so embarrassed, but I thought, oh yeah, that's so cool. Yeah. And the other thing is that that is actually sort of how some of these other films that it's kind of they go along the same, that same vein. Yeah, there's um, a lot of Ron worship in these films. Yeah, in TR 16, it's the same way. He's coaching these guys. No, you got to do this, and no, you got to do right, this. Right, 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 right. And then, and then in the end, it's like, sir, you're amazing. You were, we were able to snap this whole thing together with your help. Yeah, and you're just like, yeah. You're like, this is, this is so, it's so cringy. It's so cringy when you think back on it. It's yeah, so cringy. It's like, oh my god, but it's just like you're oblivious to it. Yeah, and these um, are and these films are very popular among students that are training oh, yeah. to, to do Scientology because they're yeah. really the only. If you're training to be um, an executive, or if you're training to to do some kind of administrative post, there's nothing like this for those yeah. 
posts really they might they might have to watch one or like maybe orientation was a film that they uh, an executive yeah, i think also they might watch the testing film also yeah the maybe there's like maybe a couple but if you're the ones that are about about staffs and organizations there are yeah. a few so they'd watch those so. but if you're training to be an, a, a counselor or someone who audits does the scientology counseling on another person the higher you get up you have to watch more and more of these films yeah. And yeah. you might watch one of these films in 10 years of Scientology courses and stuff. You might watch some of these films hundreds and hundreds of times each. Because yeah. you're supposed yeah. to watch, you're encouraged to watch them over and over and over again. Uh, what does he say? Hubbard says, uh, number, number of, of times over equals over certainty. Equals and certainty. <laughs> yeah, we're never going to yeah. forget that. I know. Where there's, there's some, every once in a while, um, I, can't, I can't remember what it was now, but I, I was talking to my wife, Claire, and I was like, what's that thing when you do the thing? And, you know, and she was like, I can't believe you don't remember. I was like, that's a good thing. I think. Yeah, and that I really is a good thing. Like, yeah. I'm overriding some of my old memories. Yeah, your brain's letting go. It's really yeah, the synapses good. is like, we're never going to use this. Yeah, just, no. uh, just erase. No, yeah. <laughs> but, Unneeded. Um, yeah, but there are things like that. Number of times over equals certainty and understanding um, that you just there. But so that's a common theme in Scientology. You do these things. There's a lot of uh, repetitious brainwashing. Drill, drill, drill. That's. Oh, my goodness. I'm trying to think of anything else. So when you guys reshot it, was there yeah. any particular talent or. Uh, well, you I, the, that the, messenger? yes, there was um, the guy who played the messenger. I, I'm, I'm sorry. I forgot his name. He's a wonderfully talented actor. He's also owns a reclaimed woodworking and wood supply business. He's a very. Very talented guy. Um, ah, I can't. He built a piece of furniture for me. He's a wonderful guy. Uh, so he was in the the. the I remember team. Al Clegg and the other guy. <laughs> what about you? Yeah, no, I just, I just for some reason his his name it, slips my mind. It's not moment. like you worked with thousands and thousands of actors over the years. Either. Yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> which I did, but no, this guy he was in the professional tiaras chorus. He played one of the two main actors. Uh, oh, wow. He was in. When he was in this. That. Yeah, he was in this film. We he should mention. In, we should mention this before we t talk what? about this. Yeah, almost all of these films, even the one that Mitch just mentioned, um, were shot previously by yeah. some uh, by L. Ron Hubbard, some by the uh, the crew yeah, in the nineties. Yeah. But almost all of these films had to be reshot because, yeah, for instance, um, Larry Anderson that we spoke about, he yeah. is per, declared uh, persona non grata by Scientology yeah. Yeah. as has been just about every main actor in the films that we originally. Yeah. Saw. Yeah. Eventually so many people left these films and sp left the Scientology and spoke out rendering the films useless, which is weird because Scientology is such an insulated bubble that the people inside that bubble probably never heard of Larry Anderson. They That's probably right. Never knew that all this horrible stuff happened. Yeah. But Especially but, years later. Yeah, but still, they had to be remade. Uh, but that's and, the best part. They had to be remade. And the actors, the, the, these films, <laughs> Scientology teaches you that the their goal is to clear the planet, to make right. everyone a clear, a Scientologist yeah, clear. Unless you're an actor in a film. Line. Yeah, <laughs> but if you're an, a Scientology actor, you can't be in a Scientology film because then you might not be in Scientology anymore. Yeah, after uh, uh, Miscavige like laid the law, he said no more Scientologists in these films. We're just going to hire actors from the outside. So there's this whole group of people out there that can never be in Scientology. Yeah. It's weird. It's the most it's because they might like, leave Scientology and then yeah, they have to redo those films. <laughs> exactly. It, it is kind of like this amazing case of an organization being biased against its own members. Totally. So it's, yeah. it's and, and the it's just so crazy. It's if it's mind boggling if you think about it that we don't want you to be in our film because you might end up getting into Scientology yeah. and then leaving Scientology. So we just want to hire you to be an actor. But the actresses and the actors that are already gung-ho Scientologists and are, want to be in the films, you no can't way. be in the film because you're No, no, no. All leave. of these films you see, everything you see that's out in the public, like the Way to Happiness film, yeah. like the, uh, the, the Super Bowl ads, all of these, none of those people are Scientologists. The people yeah. that are playing auditors and that are playing people receiving auditing, none of them are. They can't be by policy 
because Miscavige is too afraid that they're going to leave and speak out. I have a couple of friends that I made over the years who were these actors who were never Scientologists and yeah. are still my friends today. And they'll never work for Scientology again. Yeah, I think I'm actually friends with Shane Johnson on Facebook. <laughs> Oh, that's a really because Shane yeah. is kind of he's a kind of under the radar quasi Scientologist. I think I might be friends with him on Facebook. And there's another guy. Do you remember a guy named Jack Maxwell? Absolutely. Was he in? Yeah, he was from the, the What is Happiness video. What? That's what it was. I could never yeah. remember. I'm like, yeah. I know this guy. I shot with this guy. I remember he was buying a Starbucks in downtown LA on, on uh, Grand Avenue because yeah. we were so broke. We didn't have any money. He's like, do you guys want me to buy you some coffee or something? Yeah. I was like, yeah. no, this is not good. This is going to come back to, to yeah. buy that the talent yeah. is, can see like these guys are ragtag. They're, they're not running on uh they're not running. No, on no. Jack Maxwell. Yeah, no, I'm friends with him on Facebook too. Yeah, he's a good, good guy. <laughs> he's good amazing. Actor. And he is the most recognizable dude we ever shot in a million years. Yeah, he he's was just, in the. Uh, he has a really he, cool look, and he's just yeah, a really. Chill yeah, he's kind of a kind of a, a James Dean kind of character. He reminds me of uh, um, the guy that used to play Starbuck on uh, Battlestar Galactica. Uh, very much so. Face. Yeah, very much so. Yeah. Yeah, you remember he was also in Tears in Life, which I don't, yes. I don't know. Yeah, he he played the the guy who put the pick through his toe. That's he put right. Pick through his boot. Yeah. The, did we shoot that in the oil field? We did in the actual real oil field down in, in, in LA. Down near downtown LA. We have to do a well, whole no, it, it's, it's actually called Ladera Heights. It's on the way yes. to the airport. Yeah, that's right. On the way to the yeah. airport, we got to do it. What well, that was, uh, TR1. Did we already cover? Did we already do? TR1? I don't think so. That, that we should do that. That's an amazing yeah. film. Uh, that was the film we shot in black and white. Yeah, um, there's like we got really we shot in black and white. Yeah, don't tell any of the stories because there's some really, yeah, so yeah, I'm not yeah, going to, but getting back to EM5 for a second. There's yes. a very interesting piece of there's a another very interesting connection between well, a lot of people may be aware of uh well know who you may or may not know who Lenny Riefenstahl is. Lenny Riefenstahl is a very noted uh documentary filmmaker. She was hired by Adolf Hitler. She was like a superstar in Germany in the 30s as an actor, as a director, as a actress. She was hired by Adolf Hitler uh personally. She directed two films, Triumph of the Will and Olympia for the Nazis, and they are considered to be two of the greatest, most effective propaganda films of all time. I found out about it in film school. Her work is still studied. Uh, and it's a very strange story. We could do a whole episode on it. Um, it, it, it she collapsed. So through a very strange series of circumstances, she uh, Hubbard ended up rewriting a film, her most famous film, which was called The Blue Light, which is a film she did before uh, she worked for Hitler. Before It was a pre-war film. Uh, it's a notable film. You can see it. It's even on YouTube. You can watch it. Uh, so the whole circumstances about how she and Hubbard co colluded and did this thing. Damn, I actually meant I had some stuff here I wanted to show, but oh, I have um, the picture. I have yeah, the we have this. We have this one letter. So, uh, so people have reported on this. Tony Ortega did a very nice article about this. I've written about it in my book. I have more of the material than anybody else. I have a copy of the script that Hubbard wrote. Uh, I have letters. He, between, like he punched up. No, no, no. He. This is actually well. The script is yeah. It's his script. It's his English language version. He was hoping to reboot his quote unquote filmmaking career, which never happened because when I researched it, I found out Hubbard was only in Hollywood for 10 weeks. Yeah. And I've got to tell you, if you come to Hollywood and you have a job for 10 weeks, you were fired. <laughs> like nobody wanted you around. If you couldn't make more than 10 weeks, right? But this entire illustrious L. Ron Hubbard L. Ron Hubbard, the filmmaker. <laughs> yeah, the screenwriter is a bunch of bullshit. So, but he was hoping to reboot his kind of film script writing career. And, and in honesty, in, in terms of Hollywood, the footnote about L. Ron Hubbard is some of his dime novels were used uh, as, as source material for serials. Serials that you never That's, heard of yeah, unless like we Island. told you. Of, yeah, yeah. The Secret of Treasure Island. You never heard of unless we told you about them. Yeah, we ain't talking like, about Dorito and. Uh, yeah, we're not talking about Buck Rogers here. So yeah. anyway, um, he and Lenny Riefenstahl managed to come together in 1960. What is that? 15 years after the Germans are defeated. He's now collaborating with this, this woman who almost went to prison for being a Nazi collaborator. Uh, 
And he's also and, trying to find out about this Africa thing, right? Yeah. And so what happens is, so I'm, I'm reading, I'm researching this. I'm reading through all the documentation I have, which was given to me like as a gift by David Miscavige. I have the stack. But was it because you were doing this film and this had it some kind of no, 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 no. I'm writing a book and I'm reading all this stuff. I'm going through and I'm very carefully reading the letters. There's a letter. You can bring it up. Like there is no doubt that Hubbard was dear friends with Lenny Riefenstahl. This is a letter from Lenny Riefenstahl from her production company because she's still not trying to make films. This is from July 11th. What does that say? July 1979. Yeah, 1979. Okay. And I can't read it, but maybe if you can see it, you can read it. I don't have it in front of me. Yeah, it says it's written for, it's on her letterhead. And it says right. Mr. L. Ron Hubbard, St. Hill Manor. So she's writing to him in East Gridstead in uh, Sussex right. in England. Right. And it says, Dear Ron, I was very much surprised and pleased. Uh, and I was very much surprised and pleased. I to hear know. from you after oh. such a long time. Yeah, there you go. I regret yes. to say that I cannot provide photos of South African village because I never been in that part of the continent. I spent my time mostly in the Sudan or in East Africa. However, I can send you a photo of a Nuba village if you want. In this case, I have to know whether in color or black and white and which size. I hope you are doing well. I should be glad to meet you again. With kind regards, Lenny Riefenstahl. Yeah, so let there be no doubt that wow. Hubbard is friends with this Nazi collaborator. I mean, there That's is absolutely so crazy. There is absolutely zero doubt. So I'm reading this letter and I'm saying, wait a minute, I'm looking at the date, uh, 79. He's not at St. Hill in 79. He's yeah, at he La Quinta. In, yeah, he was in the uh in he's the La Quinta. <laughs> yeah, he's in La Quinta. So obviously, this is still like his international mailing address because yeah. he's on the run from the FBI because the Snow White breaking just <laughs> happened. Oh, yeah, so this he, is right around when it was right. And so he's hiding out by guardians he's, off. He's time. hiding out in this in this compound, right? With our dear friend Mike Rinder and our dear not friend David Miscavige, but he's with all of these people, right? And he's hanging out in La Quinta. Well, and no, David, right. I don't think David Miscavige was with was ever with him at that time. No, I think he was. No, was it, but what, they were shooting films on La Quinta. And we have pictures of no, Dave on well, the yeah, camera. Well, yeah, that's what I'm saying. When he that that was when that was. Oh, you're right. You know what? This was yeah. six years before, um, like religious tech, not all the crazy. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. This Guardians is when he was right. like, he was a messenger and he was like trying he to was, be a cameraman and yeah, all that crazy shit. Camera, oh, but 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 the real <laughs> point is, I'm reading this letter from Riefenstahl, and you can tell from the letter that Hubbard had requested pictures of Africa. He is, it is a historical fact that at this time in 79, he's writing the tech film scripts, right? Yeah. There's only one technical training film that takes place in Africa. So yeah. if you put this all together, he is reaching out to his old Nazi collaborator friend saying, hey, Lenny, you got any pictures of Africa? Because I'm about to do a film in Africa. And when I read this, I was like, holy shit, like this whole village was based on information in Africa that he Lenny Riefenstahl published a very notable book of, of a African na native life. She did publish some photography books. They would never let her make a film again. She and she was a pariah of the German cinema. I mean, she on her death, she was referred to as proto-feminist fascist filmmaker. Right. The, the, wow. If those those two things can exist together. So I it, this is just this another weird piece of history that people don't realize that this yeah. was yeah that it was lenny riefenstahl's photo exposition e expedition to africa that then informed hubbard about writing this film about him being a white savior and helping yeah. this this special mission project out so yeah well, just thought not, i'd share that so. yeah it's that's a pretty i mean this is all insanely wild like just this, right. this kind of backstory and this is for a silly film about how you're setting up an e-meter like yeah literally. and like like who's he gonna reach out to for help about africa well i know this nazi broad you know she used to work for hitler she's over in africa i'll just give her a send her you know send her a letter and she's writing back to saint hill thinking that he's still the head of yeah of this worldwide movement so that's so wild and yeah, yeah it's crazy the, the other thing that's wild about any of this sort of um, backstory and this different stuff, like I will, I'll, I'll definitely put a link to this uh, Chris Owen thing in there. Yeah, please. You, you can see that Hubbard was, he had plans. And I think, I genuinely believe 
that that is where Hubbard wanted to set up what is now the Flagland base. In Africa. In Africa, because he yeah. was trying to buy a hotel there and he was trying to buy these properties and he was trying to do these different things. And he was trying to do it because in one of these um, documents that he's quoted as saying about this area is that they have about 270,000 people. And he's like, we have more than 270,000 Scientologists worldwide. So this is actually like a down statistic in our in our view to take over this small little place. Right. And, um, and you're just like, oh, he was trying to set up a, a base there where he was going to be a, a popular dude and the people would look to him for solutions. Right. He actually wrote a special kind of what's called a security check in Scientology, which is where they interrogate you and right. try to uncover what crimes you have in order to uh, to further your Scientology spiritual counseling uh, product activity or effect effectiveness uh you can't have these hidden crimes that you're you're covering up and he wrote a special one of those called the joe burke sec check because they that the people that lived in that area were a particularly hard case to crack and um so they had to they were extra super uh criminal and he would have to uh, get to the bottom of this so Hubbard definitely had uh, idea, uh, some wild ideas, and uh, it's amazing that uh, more people don't know about these. And like I said before, we did edit out a lot of these racial things and references yeah. in, in his reco audio recordings, yeah. but um, they're very nuanced in these films, and they're sort of well, they like they just bleed in because it's. It it's his it's his basic uh it's his uh cultural indoctrination it's his cultural programming is very misogynistic and very uh, homophobic and very racist and it bleeds into his work yeah. uh, it's just it's a natural thing it's like his 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 pathology i do want to just share one thing uh, with our viewers i think they'll appreciate this in, in this all began in 1995 i was up at golden i was reading lenny riefenstahl's uh uh, memoir, it was a 600 and some page memoir. Uh, and I'm reading it and I come across this passage in the book. She's, uh, and I'm going to read it because what I, I'm going to just read this It's very short. She says, Philip, Philip was a student, by the way. Well, you'll find out Philip, Philip wrote, he had a, he had found a gifted American author to collaborate on the script. She's talking about the blue light. This American he enthused is a brilliant and famous writer who has written many screenplays for Columbia and Hollywood. He is also the head of a great international organization that is spread across the entire globe and has more than a million members. His name is L. Ron Hubbard. He is a psychologist and a Scientologist. Lenny Riefenstahl, a memoir, page 448. So this is like the crazy BS that was being fed to her about this guy. So wow. it... it yeah. So anyway, and then and then the two of them, I have all the letters going back and forth and, you know, Hubbard like writing about doing the project and da da da, da. And I, I probably will do some content on it. I've written about it in a book It's because it's, it's pretty crazy because this was a person that I was interested in since film school. Lenny Riefenstahl. I mean, this is a person that I literally had been studying since I was, you know, for many years. So I, I got very excited when I found that excerpt in the book and I put a tab on it. I sent it up to Miscavige's office, like an hour later. Hold on one second. <laughs> no, this will be worth it. Just I know. I know what you're going to grab. You're going to probably grab the thing. I wanted to actually yeah, say I this while, while Mitch I, is I, grabbing I, this. There's no, a I, was, I thought it was right here, but it's not. I, I have the folder. Okay. I, I, I want to say something, though, about Yeah, this. go ahead. There's like Sea Org members that worked at the international headquarters. I would say maybe 10% of them ever talked to David Miscavige, like directly. Had That's, a absolutely. Okay. Maybe absolutely. 10%, at, at, at a maximum 10% of those people were having direct communications with David Miscavige. Now, and even a lesser amount than that would have a written conversation back and forth with David Miscavige. Even oh. I was at that property for 15 years. I would, I would say that maybe in the entire 15 years, I had maybe 50 to 75 direct communications with David Miscavige, like back and forth on one thing right. over a period of week would be one thing. I, yeah. I would say I maybe had 75 of those in my 15 years. Mitch 
<laughs> I would estimate, and correct me if I'm wrong, I would estimate okay. he's, had, he's had at least 10,000 yeah. back and forth communications with David Miscay. Yeah. I mean, yeah, we were, I, yeah. We were yeah. shooting films. He would have one or two a day for, okay, so for Mark, years, decades. Do you remember in the RTC headquarters before they built the big $50 million building? Yeah. Up in those headquarters, or they had, in a room, there was a bunch of transcribers, and then they had these the big filing cabinets that they could roll. Yeah, I went up. I rarely ever had any reason to go up to that office, but I was up to. I went up to that office with him one day. We're walking into his office. We're walking past the filing cabinets, and he says, "You see those filing cabinets? Those filing cabinets are the written communication between you and me. There is more at this time. Uh, this was like early two thousands, late nineties. He said." There is more written communication between you and I than between me and anyone else in the world. There you go. <laughs> so now, it was I like, was thinking about and, this. But Mark, day. I thought I, I thought of this going, <laughs> how does Mitch get this this all this stuff with L. Ron Hubbard and this Lenny? How do you say the last name? Riefenstahl. 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 How does Mitch get his hands on this? And I think, and then I re realized I go, Mitch, that's when I started thinking about it. I go. Mitch was having a conversation with David Miscavige every single day. Multiple. Every single day of the week. So the fact that um, that he has this is not, it's wild that he, that he has this, but it's also, if you think about it, it's not because David Miscavige was talking with Mitch so regularly and so uh, for, it was, I would say almost the most consistent person that was always on the same exact job because even on the communications that i have they're from like maybe four or five different jobs they're not all the same job yeah no i think i had my job longer than anybody but him i mean consistently like i was on that you know because everybody changed posts so much you know that yeah. nobody's yeah. on the same job for very long so but yeah. that's not something that i'm I, I have to say one thing though when i was reflecting back on all this stuff and i was thinking about that day that he said there's more written communication yeah. It occurred to me that he was there could there of course was a lot but I think he was also lying about that because he would always say things to pump people up. Like he would say, you see those filing cabinets? There's more written communication between, you know, blah blah blah. blah. Oh yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I thought and about that later and I thought this guy's so full of shit. He just nonstop lies to everybody. But also that sometimes you, there'd be one little nugget like the one you just showed, this letter. Yeah. That right. could be the, all there is, that and the script and whatever it is. And you could have said, you know, there's, a, you know, that's what I'm going to give you. But, you know, what we've got. And he, even when I got a tour from him of L. Ron Hubbard's house, he right. showed me the next e meter, the one where you can, right, right, right. It's wireless that it can detect the body thing. Yeah. You don't, you could be dead. You could be audited when you're, you no longer have a body. And, and I'm, and, but that's up in L. Ron Hubbard's house. But yeah. no, I'd never even heard of that before he told yeah. me that i was like what are you talking yeah. about and i was i never you know I, i'm not i haven't even read dianetics i'm not even clear nothing so for him to talk about this e-meter that works wirelessly i'm just like the what yeah like, yeah this is like you're in like yeah it was crazy this this is is they spent shit up here. <laughs> they spent so much money on that meter it was like a cst <sighs> project yeah they spent i i think just to build physically build that that one model that you saw cost a hundred thousand dollars these are fucking sorry these, this is a group that doesn't even get proper medical treatment for its members yeah and yet they, they can spend a hundred thousand dollars building the most insanely useless device you could possibly imagine you can't get contacts through financial planning but we're going to spend six hundred thousand dollars on designing this box for the e-meter yeah so we can audit you when you're dead we're going to have the people that designed the iphone boxes come and design our yeah, exactly. e box. <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah. but, but thirty dollar contacts from walmart no that's too much we no, can't. you can forget it you can just forget it okay guys i think we covered well, this was a great uh a great video after a little bit of a break so we hope you guys enjoy this um if you guys haven't uh, got a copy, we'll put a uh, link in the description to uh, to Mitch's site and um, Mitch's YouTube channel, and also Mitch's book. If you haven't uh, got got your hands on that yep. yet, we'll got put a book. Links, all that below. And then, um, yeah, uh, I, we have to think of uh, this was a good one. If we've got another film like this that we actually have some meat, it's hard to go through these films and cover them. 
because uh, we don't have a lot of documents that we can or stuff that we can. Yeah, show. We, I wasn't this exactly one. stuffing stuffing my pockets full of <laughs> full of evidence. I don't know. How about you, Mark? I wasn't exactly. <laughs> you know what? I told this story before. I don't know if I've told it on YouTube, but what? the night before I left in January of 2005. Yeah. Um, I had access to David Miscavige's private photo server. Mm. And because I set up the networking of the whole entire property. Right, and so I, could, right. I pretty much had right. like shared folders on every single server that I would configure things with. Right. And that sometimes would lead to other little finds. But um, I had Jeff Baker had D David Miscavige's entire personal photo server on this um, a visual effects right. network. And um and I went in there and I got pictures of him with the Beckhams and Tom and snowmobiling. Oh here. my God. And I just filled up this hard drive. I filled it up with all kinds of like, holy mo. I'd never even been to it. I was looking for something else and I saw this. Anyway, I, I put, I had a decent sized drive that I filled up with all these photos. And um, when I escaped, um, I actually fell asleep waiting for my wife to come home. She never came home. And then when I woke up, I realized, oh, shit, I overslept. I got to get I'm supposed to GTFO right now and get get out of here. And um, I left that drive on the ironing <laughs> board in my in my place. <laughs> wow. So well, anyway, somebody's going to leave with all those photos, Mark. You know, some, it. some like, day it's, it's we're going to happen. All, all that shit's going to come out. Somebody's going to leave from like uh, Sheila with the with from the manufacturing site where they, they handle all the yeah, technical training films. films. Yeah. Somebody's going to leave from the, somebody's going to, all this stuff is just going to start coming out. Cause it's just like, yeah, hopefully. I mean, it'll yeah. just be more, it would, it would also be fun for these films to eventually become oh, public and then would to you, be able to go back and watch our videos and then see, see this yeah. is what we were talking about. Yeah, exactly. We, yeah. Tech film film festivals. So it's going to happen eventually. I they're going to so. come out for sure. Awesome, dude. Well, thanks again. Thanks for everybody that tuned in. And uh, until next time. Thanks for watching. If you'd like to help support the channel, feel free to check out the merch store link in the description. We have Hail Xenu, Xenu is my homeboy, and BFG branded mouse pads, shirts, mugs, all sorts of other stuff in there that helps us to bring you new content on a regular basis. You can also pick up a copy of my book, Blown for Good, Behind the Iron Curtain of Scientology, in hardback, Kindle, and Audible versions as well. There's also a link to our podcast, and you can get that on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you'd like to watch another video, you can click on this link right here, or you can click on this one here, or you can click on the subscribe button right here. Thanks a lot. Until next time.